Hello everyone, welcome to the Ganesh, uh, the Comprehensive Guide to Ganesh in the support role, sorry I had a brain fart there, and when I'm, of course, playing support as Ganesh, I'm looking at the enemy team primarily. Now, this is a fairly interesting case where I wind up building Gauntlet of Thieves despite, at first glance, the enemy team comp not necessarily supporting that idea. Because if you look at the enemy team composition, they only have two sources of magic damage. Right, we have Xing Chen and Persephone. Then we have Gilgamesh, Rom, and Bastet, three physicals. However, the reason I go with Gauntlet of Thieves in this particular case is for two very specific reasons. First, Xing Tian's first ability, Ferocious Roar does percentage of health damage, and that's going to really hurt me as a support because I'm going to have pretty high max health. That's just how that works, right? So that's going to be problematic for me. So I'm going to want to resist magic damage more than normal because I'm going to be taking extra damage from Xing Tian, basically. I want the extra protections to sort of counterbalance the fact that Xing Tian is going to be hurting me pretty damn bad. Secondly, my ADC is Scotty, and Scotty is very strong in the early game due to Calder absolutely slapping. So unless this goes south really quickly, overall, I should have very little trouble lasting through the early game and building Gauntlet of Thebes and having that stack properly, right? Generally speaking, it really shouldn't be too much of an issue. So, with that being said, let's get into it. So, this is... we're just going to go ahead and skip to this. I've planted my, my ward there. And you'll notice that Scotty here, she's standing on the edge, and she actually makes sure that she's testing her range to indicate to me... This is a little loud. What the hell is this volume here? There we go. There, that's better. Uh, now we're going to lower that down a little bit more. Anyways, you'll notice that she's standing at the edge here and she throws some spears. This is to indicate to me that, yes, she is prepared to pull that aggro initially. So I am comfortable letting her get that first hit. She absolutely slaps them, grip, get the buff nice and quick. Fantastic. But that's what you want to see as a support from your ADC at that point. You want to see them indicate, you know, here's where I'm going to stand and here's how I'm going to be doing that. And you'll notice throw down the hog, just walk, right? I don't want to slow down. I don't need to slow down. She's got Calder. Here we are in lane, busting this out. There's Xing Chun. There's good old Rom. Now, originally, I was going to go for the front line, but I decide the back line is the better option here, and then I take some poke here, and then I'm just trying to stack up some damage on Xing Chun here. And you'll notice that they haven't hit level 2 because they didn't kill our back line, right? Now, I could have used Terrific Curse there, but I really didn't want to in that specific situation because the only real point would be to potentially kill Xing Qian, which I wanted to do a little bit more than that. I wanted to also be able to hit Rom with it and have him do reduced damage as well. He uses his jump, which I expected he had gotten. Usually when a Xing Qian gets that low, the very next ability that... Well, most Xing Qians pick up their jump as their second ability for the reason that, you know, they don't want to die. <laughs> Now, you'll notice I actually specifically shifted this way. You can actually see me shift. Because if you look at the minimap here, you can see them killing the wave. They kill the wave here. You can see where the Xing Tian starts moving here. I'm shifting this way so I can see what he's doing. And then he makes the attempt to take it. But we still get it. And I'm committing on this because she can ice that off. She absolutely picks up that Q. Absolutely fantastic. This is a great Scotty, by the way. And then we're just, you know, doing the... Trying to eliminate the enemy team here. I go on ahead and poke Xing Tian. And I chase this. And I unfortunately miss my dash. It would have been really nice. So I use my horrific curse. He jumps away. I honestly probably shouldn't have used my horrific curse there. I think it was a little unnecessary in retrospect. But I was really trying to get a get Scotty a kill there specifically. Again, I'm Ganesh. I can't get kills when she's that close. And back in we go for the good old clearing of the wave. Unfortunately, though, we're a little behind on this because we were clearing the Harpies and they started a little bit before us. I initiate a little too early on Xing Tian here. I'm taking a lot of damage. I have no mana, right? And now Xing Tian is applying some pressure to Scotty. I'm trying to, you know, get him killed. 
he gets, you know, very low, but I'm taking a lot of damage myself. And again, I don't have any mana. So at this particular point, while Xingtian ES is almost dead, on the other hand, we've got the very serious problem of both of us being very low and the ROM being in relatively good condition. So I actually get paranoid and throw down a ward, actually. But the ROM is in pretty good shape, so I'm somewhat concerned at this point as a support. I'm healing and my health will be fine by the time we get back to lane. My concern is that Scotty and I have very low mana compared to the enemy team at this point, well, compared to Rom specifically, and I'm very concerned about the possibility that we're going to get out-cleared this wave due to that. But all we can do is give it our best. I do have the Scepters, so that's fairly encouraging. Here's Xingxian back. You can see he's in worse condition than I am, but there's Rom almost full, right? It's pretty spooky. Now, Scotty goes back, and I'm going to go back initially, but then I realize that I don't have the money for Gauntlet of Thebes. I try to poke Zing Tian. That doesn't work, so I go back, right? I'm just going on ahead and prepping to grab that at some point, and I realize, you know, I'm just going to stick around. I have, I only stick around because I have the benefit, very specifically, of the totem giving me mana and i have plenty of health it's just a mana issue at this particular point so i'm just you know here and i'm going to be clearing one more wave with scotty so i can get up to the 1750 that i need for my gauntlet i don't want to go back to fountain without the money i need for the gauntlet so i go on ahead and throw that down i back up because i don't want to give the impression that i'm sticking around for too long and there's the gold that I need for Gauntlet of Thebes. So, boom, get that. And then I'm going to be moving immediately to the mid lane. Because, obviously, uh, I'm expecting Zingtian to be at that point in the near future. Now, Scotty picks up a great kill on Bastet. This gives us a really nice advantage. This gives Lancelot a huge advantage because Lancelot actually traverses the jungle faster due to his horse. Plus, he was already level ahead. So, that's a really big deal, actually. Uh, to be honest, I'm going to be really honest. I didn't mention this up until now, but I'm going to go on ahead and give you the spoiler warning. The enemy team does surrender in this match, and the only reason I've been uploading surrenders is because that's a majority of the matches right now, unfortunately, in Conquest. A lot of people surrender. It's it's a bit of a problem for me recording because I like to not upload surrenders, but unfortunately, I really don't have any other option when that's all I'm getting, right? <laughs> But I suspect that this was actually a really big turning point in the match, looking back at it, because, quite honestly, again, we are absolutely tearing through. Uh, we were already ahead at this point. Lancelot is level 5 already. He, again, does move faster than Bastet. He can rotate faster. He can gank faster, etc. So this turns out to be, I suspect, the, the beginning of the snowball for us. Now, they do make a nice recovery in the mid-game. Again, mild spoilers. But at the end of the day, I think that the death of Bastet right at that point sort of seals the deal. Because what this means for their team is that if any lane starts falling behind, she's not going to be as likely in a position to help that lane recover, right? Because that's half the point of ganking, is to help that lane recover from falling behind. But if your jungler is behind, then there's no way that they're going to be able to help that lane recover. So, I think that was a really big deal. Now, at this particular point, I was just trying to apply some pressure to Persephone, so that way I could help Vulcan farm here, and that works, generally speaking. She does back up. She gets some poke on Vulcan anyways, though, because he wanders into that. She came back up. Right, he's just poking. I was just making sure that he wasn't going to commit too hard to that. I'm just looking to split these camps. He goes back around the aggressive way, which I was surprised by, and I get really concerned, especially since here's Xing Tian. Uh, there's Vulcan's beads. I'm trying to force the Persephone away. The Xing Tian is cut off. I'm just trying to, again, get some damage. I'm not expecting a kill at this point, right? And here comes Lancelot. And uh, here's Bastet, right? I'm just, again, keeping an eye on him, making sure that nothing's going down. It's fine. Lancelot goes over there. Now, I'm going to try to counter-rotate because I'm expecting Zingtian to head over there, but he's right in the middle there. You can see he's in mid, and then they kill... They've got Rom right here. I really should have turned back around and gone back to mid lane. I did not need to be here for this. I was personally expecting I would have to tank the tower a little bit while Scotty killed him, but no. I really should have... Once I saw Zingtian in the mid lane, still in mid lane, I really should have just turned around and left. Right. 
that that was a mistake on my part. I lost out on some stacks there. I lost out on some experience. So that was a big mistake on my part. That that was a bad call on my part. At the very least, though, it only affected me individually, right? So a bad call, but a relatively minor mistake in the long run. It put me a little bit behind where I should be in terms of golden experience. Again, this is just me trying to apply some poke to uh, Persephone there. It's not really a big deal. But yes, that was that was a mistake on my part. Absolutely. At this particular point, I just want to come over here and grab this. And then I'm going to rejoin Vulcan. I'm going to come in from this angle. And this is where I realized she absolutely had a ward. She timed that too perfectly to not have that side warded. So I now know she has a ward there. Which is worth mentioning. It, this comes up again later on in the match where somebody else mentions that she has to have a ward there. She's, she just wards there consistently. Now I was originally going to go back before I saw Lancelot coming in. And I wanted to potentially be there in case he was going to initiate. He didn't. He went south rather than going into lane. So you can actually see where not only I decided because I'm starting to back and then I see Lancelot coming in here I'm wondering is he going to come in here because I want to be there if he does if he does but he goes down here so I go over here to pick up this green buff that Vulcan has dropped for me it's really transparent what my thought process was there so pick up my buff and off I go back to mid lane and right now, right now, my concern here is they've initiated a fight with Xingxian. Xingxian is fighting back, and everyone here is in relatively good condition. I'm really concerned that Bestet's going to beat me here, because that would be fairly problematic. Bestet has since mostly caught up to Lancelot, and I was expecting Xingxian to ult right there, to be honest. But at this point, you know, Xingxian backs off. I'm just looking for some poke here. Yes, I, I did just use my ult for poke. Amen that Persephone missed that, but unfortunately, Vulcan backfires into the tower and dies. And Be uh, Bestet kills Osiris in left lane while we're all busy farting around in mid lane. It, the backfire was an unfortunate incident. That was definitely uh, Vulcan having pressed the button and then getting crowd controller or, or something. A, a delayed press, maybe a panic reaction. I'm not really sure, but that definitely is what killed him there. So I'm just defending the lane at this point. And, of course, they go right. I'm assuming they're going after their damage buff because, according to ours, theirs should be up at roughly the same time. But I'm going to make the call just in case. Now, in this particular case, I am trying to decide what I want to do next for my item. I decide that I'm going to very likely go either with Contagion or I'm going to go with Breastplate of Valor in this specific instance. And that's because what I really want here is mana. Right? I haven't gotten any assists, and I'm concerned that I'm going to fall behind at this point. So what I want to be doing here is staying out in the field as long as possible for the express purpose of just being able to grab assists, right? So that is literally all I'm doing there. And just go ahead and help Vulcan with that. And then I'm going to rotate over to right lane because I haven't seen Xingqian. They just come back actually right as I'm thinking that they're going to right lane. So I come back. And then I'm, again, just going for some poke. Lancelot calls attack. I'm confused. I don't know what he means. You can actually see where I'm confused because I'm backing up. I'm trying to keep a large scope here. And it's when Lancelot goes onto the scorpion or goes past the scorpion that I realize he's talking to Osiris. So now my concern is getting Vulcan out, which with all these ults, it's a miracle he even got that far, right? Now, he throws out an ult and then I react way too slow to this. And there's, there's nothing I can do at this point. He's going to die to the sand. I was hoping I could maybe get him out somehow. That weird kind of um, vain hope, but nah, he was he was doomed as soon as that shot hit him. But even the Vulcan acknowledges that was a really good shot by the best. That I was I should have been aware of that. It didn't even occur to me that you would have that up. Uh, Osiris does take left tower really early on. This is nine and a half minutes in, so that's a huge benefit for our team. You can actually see the gold sway there. We're 2,000 gold ahead despite having the same number of kills. Primarily due to that. Right? Absolutely huge move. So I'm, of course, near death. So I'm going to back at this point. I don't need to be here. Vulcan's coming up. He'll come up in time to um, defend the tower. So I'm not worried about it. Zintian is back. So I'm going to be running right over there. Immediately. I'm just checking out some builds here. Nothing that particularly catches my eye. Just running up to uh, go help out my boy Vulcan. Now I see 
them working on the Pyromancer, which is a fairly bold move. I'm impressed they got away with it. But uh, I grabbed the, the tower buff. I wanted a little bit of this action for exclusively the golden experience, so I dashed back because I didn't think that they were going to be even more bold and go for that next. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, Scotty dies to Rom, but I'm too busy trying to save Vulcan. And it's it's a fairly ugly situation. At this point, I switched from trying to save Vulcan to trying to get her killed, because at the very least, I, I knew at that point I wasn't going to be able to save him, but I also can't kill Persephone. That would have been ideal, is if I could have taken Persephone out with him. That would have been really nice. She ults me. Not sure why she bothered, because that's just an easy dash out for me. <laughs> Scotty complaining about... <laughs> the... <laughs> the ROM... <laughs> But, uh, it's a good time. But, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just defending this lane right here. That's all I'm really doing. Yes, I'm running low on health. I am concerned, actually, that Bastet will attack me. So I clear the wave. Full clear. I have my stacks of Thebes at this point, so I'm not worried about it. Lancelot goes to counter gank the, well, counter attack on the, the, le the ROM. I don't have the gold for this, unfortunately, but I needed to go back. I mean, I wasn't going to survive much longer with that level of health. So I decide what I'm going to do, but, you know, we've got the Pyromancer, so I just run out. I was having a weird internal conflict on whether or not I should wait for 75 gold, but that was going to take too long, so I decided against it. Lancelot absolutely slaps Persephone here. He doesn't even need me. It's just really interesting to see a really effective solo gank from a distance. And you can, I can, I'm also paying attention at this point. Right now, I'm moving over to the right lanes because I specifically want to help Scotty take the tower, and I am expecting Bastet to come over here and gank, right? We've got a catapult. We're pressuring the tower. I was expecting a Bastet gank. She doesn't gank, which surprises me into no end. So I want to press this a little bit because Zingtian is low, but I'm told to retreat. Scotty's going back. Lancelot said retreat. Lancelot was... Not referring to me, but I took it that way. But either way, Scotty was leaving anyways, so valid. So even though it's the wrong cue, it was the correct choice of action anyways. So I'm not leaving, right? Because I don't want to press up without Scotty. And then I want to take the Oracles. And the enemy team shows up here. I think the enemy team... I'm not sure what the enemy team was thinking here. There was no reason for them to be here, right? I'm going to try to pressure the Zingtian. We have a really great situation here. He ults. I don't know why when you're that low on health you would choose to ult. That was kind of odd. I see Persephone fire off an ability, and this surprises me, right? I'm not surprised the Persephone's there. I'm a little surprised she's coming from behind. That's a bit surprising. What surprises me is Gilgamesh being here. Now, I shouldn't have been surprised by this because he's lost his tier 1, so there's nothing really specifically tying him to the left lane, at least in classic solo lane theory. But I am, in fact, concerned mildly, because while Osiris, you can see him coming in, he's still a decent distance away. And we did just take out Zingtian, but it's still currently a 4v4, and Gilgamesh is coming in really fresh. So I'm trying to keep these two separate, while you can see Scotty trying to take out Rom, which is a fairly good fight, because she's a level ahead. And then I've got Vulcan here, who I want to not get slapped as well. So I'm just trying to keep these two separate from... To Scotty at this particular point. The Gilgamesh slips by. I'm trying to do everything. Here's Lancelot, which is Aemon. This beautiful ult by Vulcan really turns this around. We were It was going to be a struggle until this. This absolutely decides this fight 100%. Like, we were already ahead, sure, but that, that clinched the fight for us. We are able to... St I mean, Lancelot cleans up Bastet. I'm chasing down this Rom. I'm just trying to prevent him from rolling away. Osiris comes in here to absolutely give him the business. And we're just going to die for him, because Osiris and I have the health and defense for this, right? I'm just waiting to uh, have him land so I can pop him up if I need to. I don't need to, but I use it anyways, just to make sure. And I I would like to take the tower, but Scotty calls Gold Fury. That's fair enough. Either or, right? They're both fairly worthy objectives. So we go for the Gold Fury. And we just absolutely thrash this thing. We get a nice bonus in gold here. And lovely. Now we're really nice and ahead. Now I'm going to keep on pressing with Vulcan here because I want the golden experience. Now I'm backing because, of course, we cleared the damage buff. I don't need to be in mid lane with him all the time. I would like him to get a little bit more golden experience by himself. 
and I need to be picking up some items. Now, at this particular point, I am picking up the um, Pestilence because I've noticed throughout the match that various enemies are building decent amounts of self-heal, uh, such as the Rom building Devourer's Gauntlet. Persephone has a decent bit of lifesteal going on there. So I know I'm going to need anti-heal because obviously Zingtian has increased HP 5 as part of his passive, and Gilgamesh provides lifesteal to his allies with that circle, so I already know I'm going to want anti-healing, and there's just so much of them building self-healing stuff, right? I think only uh, either Bastet or Persephone is building the soul eater. Uh, it's Bastet. She built soul eater. I don't think Persephone has that much lifesteal. I think she's the only one. I'll have to check the next time I see the I bring up the scoreboard in uh, the video. But at this particular point, I'm just trying to find somewhere to be because there's really not a whole lot going on. Osiris is pressing Gilgamesh, but that's not really a particularly risky situation. Even if best at ganks, that Scotty's right there. But I'm coming in because I'm kind of into because um, I'm anticipating Xingxian going over there, right? But he doesn't, so we go for Pyromancer. I was really genuinely thinking Xingxian was going to go over there, but he didn't. Not even Best Edge showed up. So, this is a free Pyromancer. Wait, there is the uh, there's the scoreboard there. Wait a minute. I want to see who it was, because I can't quite remember off the top of my head. Uh, it was Best Edge with the Soul Eater. Yeah, this is why... Well, the ROM was already building Devourer's Gauntlet, which I knew, so I was already pretty sure I was going to be building Anti-Healing. Because, again, the Zingtian has his passive... Gilgamesh has the lifesteal aura that he gives, or the circle of lifesteal that he provides when he lands from his jump. Rom had lifesteal, but then Bastet was going for Soul Eater, so I knew, yeah, I definitely need anti-healing. Right, so I'm just going to go for Pestilence here. And, you know, at this particular point, I'm just trying to figure out my enemy's next move. I'm just thinking about that this is where Scotty realizes that Persephone's awarded this thing up the wazoo. But I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what the enemy's next move is. They're clearly converging. I saw Bastet trip that ward. There's Zingtian, obviously. They're moving for something. Now, Lancelot kills Rom over and right, which is totally fine. But now, we have the enemy clustered up in approximately mid lane. And I'm not really sure what, what to do about that. Because that's what I'm thinking about right now, is there were so many enemies in mid lane. What are they doing? They're grouping up for something. Now, Osiris enters mid lane... For some unholy reason. He finds Persephone alone, which scares me, because now I don't know where Zingtian is. There's Bastet. She's coming into gank, Osiris. Here comes Zingtian. So I'm coming in to try to save Osiris or get something to happen. Right? I use my ult because I know Bastet's gonna land here, and there she is. And that also cuts off Persephone at the same time. So that gave my allies a chance to do some pretty significant damage to um Zingtian. Now, you'll notice I used Terrific Curse there on Gilgamesh when he was in his Sandstorm. That was specifically so that way he wouldn't be able to chase. Because you can actually see where the Horrific Curse actually is all I have to do to save Vulcan. Because here's Vulcan, right? Here's uh, Gilgamesh landing. Now, Gilgamesh whiffs his kick, but he can't chase the Vulcan as effectively because he doesn't have his jump and I've just Horrific Cursed him. Right Now, granted, if he'd hit that kick, probably Vulcan would still be dead, but the Horrific Curse basically just ensured that because he missed that kick, he would not be able to get Vulcan. So at this particular point, I I kind of want to take one of the towers. I want to take mid-tower. Vulcan already has that, so I'm going to come back here and uh, pick up the green buff with Lancelot. We're going to be going on to Rom. Now, I'm not sure why... Well, okay, split pushing obviously should be prevented, and that's clearly what Ram is doing, but I don't think we needed all three of us here for this. I think this is a little extreme, but I literally, as a support, have nothing else to do right at this moment. I could go back, but I want the assist credit, right? So I'm just going to stand here, and I'm just going to silence him so he can't roll away. That's all, right? That's all I really needed to do. And at this particular point, I'm just looking for some farm, so I'm going to come over here and grab this thing. I'm going to let Scotty go ahead and clear that by herself, and I'm going to go to mid lane and absorb off of Vulcan. Now, the reason why I make this choice very specifically is because Scotty is only one level higher than her competition of Rom. Right now, I make a mistake here because I want the wave, but Vulcan is clearing the harpies and Persephone shows up. So I should have just stuck with him and gone with the harpies originally. 
And I'm trying to find a way that I'm not going to get slapped by because I'm pretty sure that was Zing Chan I just saw there. It was. There he is. And so I'm just trying to... I just need to be sticking with Vulcan here and getting some assist credit. I get in time for the Harpies. But yeah, I missed his first Harpies because I was looking at the wave and he wasn't. And then Persephone shows up and I'm like, nah, I'm not even... That's not worth my time. That's not worth the trouble. So at this particular point, I know he's going for damage buff. I'm keeping an eye on Osiris because he's off by himself over there. And then there's a Gold Fury Call, which is a risk. Now, this is a risk because if you have been watching these videos for a while now... I'm not even going to bother pausing it. If you've, if you've been watching these videos for a while, you know that attacking a jungle boss like this with the entire enemy team alive is a risk. But I'm fine with this at this point. Because, see, I'm sort of hesitant until... No, nope, that's not one of my hesitation was removed. So I'm hesitant about this call of the Gold Fury, but, you know, I'm clearing the uh, damage buff here. Osiris is right here. I'm hesitant, but I know that it's been called, and I already see Scotty and Vulcan heading this way. But it's when Osiris starts fighting here, it's when Persephone enters here, right? The Gilgamesh alone isn't too unusual. That wasn't what tipped me off to the fact that this was going to be a successful Gold Fury kill. It was when Persephone entered the fight, because that is their mage, that is their solo. Here's best at their jungler. The only possible interruption is Rom, and he doesn't have his ult, so he's not going to be doing it from the jungle. Because I saw him use his ult right before he died, and it's not going to be up yet. Right, so I know we're going to be able to successfully get this because their three big damage sources are all trying to go after Osiris right now. Unfortunately, this means that essentially the team is sacrificing Osiris. Lancelot does go and try to save him because Lancelot doesn't actually need to be here for this. I need to tank it. Scotty and Vulcan need to be here for damage. And there's Rom over there, by the way. They do kill Osiris, but he did not die in vain because, quite frankly, we got the Gold Fury. Right, now at this particular point, what I'm looking to do now, obviously, we're we're fixing for a fight, right? The, the enemy team just killed Osiris, so they're going to want to try to roll that into the momentum they want for a good team fight, because now it's a 5v4, right? The pro they've made one mistake, though. I know for a fact that Ram is in lane over here, because we saw him clear a wave, I would say, what, 10 seconds ago? Less than 10 seconds ago, I saw him clear this wave. And now we're going into this team fight. So it's actually right now 4v4. And they have just spent an unknown amount of ults trying to kill Osiris. And you can actually see where they're even more fractured. Because we have Bastet and Zingtian here. We have, you know, we're splitting up. Scotty actually, Scotty's in a terrible position actually. Which is why I'm kind of over here just looking at this. I'm starting to clear these as sort of... The reason I'm clearing these is a sort of bait for the enemy. I want, I'm hoping, let me rephrase that, I am hoping one of the enemy hears me clear this and comes in to try to steal it. Because a lot of people would try that, right? That's my hope, that's my dream. That's why I'm bothering with this, right? Ultimately, they don't fall for it and just Scotty comes in here and just absolutely blasts the thing. But you can see where, because the enemy was distracted by Scotty kicking around over here, the 100% of Scotty, I had nothing to do with that. The Lancelot is able to kill the Bastet. Now, the Lancelot is able to do this because he's four damn levels ahead. Again, this, to some extent, calls back to when the Bastet fell behind from that death to Scotty early on. Obviously, it's not the whole reason why, because really, she did catch up for the most part for a bit there, but she was playing catch up while... Lancelot was basically rolling around doing whatever, right? So even though she caught up temporarily, in the long run, she was still going to be behind. Because again, she is not able to gank as effectively because she was behind at that point. She's desperately trying to farm. Lancelot was able to get some nice ganks. The rest of the team was able to pull ahead. It's a snowball effect. So Bastet dies because she's, of course, four levels down. I'm just trying to cover Scotty's back. Right, now they're on Zingtian. I don't know where any of the rest of the enemy is other than Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is obviously behind me. Scotty goes on to Persephone. So in my mind as a support, I'm thinking, all right, we've got Gilgamesh behind us. And while Scotty has a nice two-level advantage over both of them, it would be really good if we could kill Persephone so fast that Gilgamesh isn't a problem. So I activate my damage buff here, and then I'm just trying to get her killed. It happens, right? Here's Gilgamesh right afterwards. Now, Gilgamesh leaves because he understands 
that that's not going to happen. Now I go ahead and blast all my abilities because I am honestly not expecting him to have his jump up that quickly. Right, meanwhile they're killing Xing Qian and we have a great opportunity to attack the fire giant. There is a mild risk here of Rom ulting this because he wasn't involved in that team fight. Pretty sure by this point his ult is up. There is that risk, right? There's also the risk that Gilgamesh could ult this. But, this is a still a good opportunity. Not the best opportunity, but a good one. Vulcan ults it probably because he has the same fears I do. That confirm ult. And, uh... We just wind up going on ahead and clearing a bunch of jungle camps. I'm gonna back, right? Because I need healing. I need to be getting my anti-heal at this point. It's been a little overdue. I guarantee you that they have all their life steal. At this particular point, I'm trying to figure out what I want to build next. Right? I do wind up going for the Pridwin. And then I'm going to increase my greater belt for that decreased cooldown. Right? Before I realize, hey, I can get Sentinel Spoon. And that's actually a really important thing because that is going to really help me stay alive. Now, you'll see here... Right, because you can actually see where I realize that I actually am level 16 is, you know, I get all this and I put the 300 in here. I decide not to do the 300, but that doesn't take, that's a glitch, it should have taken that. So I have to sell this and then I have to go and get this, right? But, yes. I just love pointing out my own thought process because it's really fascinating to see my thought, my brain work. As it, it being my brain, it's really interesting seeing it from a different perspective. But you can see where Vulcan and Scotty were chasing down the Gilgamesh and the Zinxian. So I'm running to that right now because they're, they're as far as I know, that's a 2v3, right? I saw Gilgamesh earlier. There's Zinxian and Bastet. And while we do have a level advantage, there's, by the way, Gilgamesh, we do have a level advantage. The numbers still scare me. Vulcan, fortunately, has his beads up. And at this particular point, Scotty just wipes the floor with Bastet, so I'm going to be over here trying to keep uh, Vulcan alive. Osiris dives wicked deep. I'm throwing out my ult so I can do as much damage as possible. I activate my Belt of Frenzy so they can hit harder and attack more. I'm trying to keep her in place. I succeed, you know, get her silenced, prevent her from jumping. Zinctian is dead and the enemy team surrenders. Right? I mean, to be fair, though, they surrendered because they were going to lose at that point. We did so well in that last team fight that we were very likely going to be able to take both the Tower and the Phoenix and push up for possibly the Titan. Now, I don't think we would have won right then and there, to be honest. I know that's the perception. I know I just said that, but that's what the enemy team is thinking, right? They're thinking, all right, we've just lost this team fight by a leap and a bound. They're going to take the tower, the phoenix, and then the titan. We probably would not have. They still had two phoenixes and a tower up. We probably wouldn't have been able to take the titan that particular attempt. But the next attempt, barring absolute catastrophe, would absolutely have been successful, right? They just saved us an attempt, basically. But that's where they surrendered. And at this particular point, I'm going to talk very briefly about how people built... Because they did surrender, and I would... Oh, yeah. They did surrender, and I do want to talk about the builds very briefly. Now, again, one of the really big moments of that match was, in fact, the death of Bestet so early on. That really put her behind, right? By a whole lot. Yes, she caught up in level at some point. But catching up in level is not the same as catching up in gold. Right? She never recovered from that death. She really didn't. And I'm not going to lay into her really in this particular instance because it's not that normal for a hunter to run over there solo and blast you <laughs> while you're taking the oracles, right? That's really unusual. And so I can understand why the Bastet wouldn't have been expecting that. She was level 3, so she only had one point in each ability. It's understandable, right? But it was a huge turning point in that match. And in fact, that is a big reason why Osiris, despite in terms of score doing worse than Gilgamesh, clearly was farming more and also took the tower at nine and a half minutes. This was the result of Bastet dying at level three at the Oracle attempt. 
because that gave Lancelot the opportunity to focus very heavily on the solo lane as much as he wanted. And Osiris versus Gilgamesh is a very interesting little boxing match, to be sure. Um, and the Gilgamesh clearly was doing fairly well over there, but because Lancelot was able to gank that more often due to the death of Bastet and Bastet playing catch-up, because she wasn't ganking as often, that gave Lancelot extra time to gank, and he really used that well. Now, it's one thing for an opportunity to be created, right? Bastet's death didn't just cinch the match for us. That was an opportunity that Lancelot, as the jungler very specifically, had to be able to take advantage of. And he absolutely did. You can see he absolutely killed it. Because he saw that opening. Best at dying at level 3? Alright. Already ahead by a level because I can move faster and farm faster? Absolutely. Let me capitalize. And boy howdy did Lancelot capitalize. He did an absolutely fantastic job capitalizing on that. And quite honestly, that's what allowed the Osiris to pull ahead and take that tower at nine and a half minutes. That's what made sure that Vulcan, even though he was getting ganked fairly frequently, we had a nice amount of counter ganks. It's why Lancelot was able to go over and kill the Rom every so often. That one best debt death did start the snowball rolling. But I must shout out very specifically the really great performance by Lancelot in this match to have the awareness and skill to see that opportunity be created and capitalize on it. Okay? Great, absolute fantastic gameplay out of Lancelot. Hands down. But with that being said, um, build-wise, I've been looking at it. Not really a whole lot. Now, Bestet does make one mistake in that she finishes the Transcendence despite having died at level 3. When you die early on in the match as the jungler, you generally don't want to finish into a stacking item. You generally... Uh, Soul Eater is fine if, if Soul Eater is your second item because that, regardless of what role you are, because that stacks every time you see anything die, that stacks fairly quickly. You're not really going to lose a lot of progress on that. But dying that early and finishing Transcendence really shoots you in the foot, because it's already a bit slower to build stacks as a jungler, because a decent number of your stacks are coming from jungle camps, which are three at a time, rather than the full six at a time that a classic wave is, right? A minion wave. So it's a little slower as a jungler to build stacks. So when you're looking to build stacks, you are very heavily gambling on the idea that you will do well enough in the early game to make that worth. Okay? Because she died, that stopped being worth. She should have pivoted to something else. Great options would have been Hydra's Lament. Maybe Heartseeker. Yes, Heartseeker is more expensive, but it would have been instant power and penetration. Instant MP5, right? Not as much power as Transcendence, obviously, but it would have been an instant jump in power, and it would have possibly given her the damage output she could have needed to catch up and stay caught up, right? Possibly. But I think that would be really her doubling down on the mistake in that particular instance, right? Now, Vulcan kind of made the same mistake with Book of Thoth, but we had Lancelot really ahead, so Vulcan got away with it. But again, Vulcan probably should have pivoted when he died. He didn't die as early, though, so... Uh, that really becomes then a question of how many stacks in you are. If you already have the full item by the time you start falling behind, then obviously it's too late, but it is a risk, right? I'm not going to talk about the Vulcan specifically because I can't remember off the top of my head when he first started falling behind. I'm, pre I'm pretty sure he had the item at that point. But what I do find somewhat problematic for Vulcan, and this is the only reason probably, I won't even say probably, this is the primary reason he had so much trouble was the really 
early building of Obsidian Shard. You don't generally want to be busting out Obsidian Shard as your third item. That is a lot of percentage penetration at a point in the game where not a whole lot of enemies are going to have enough magic protections to make that worthwhile. Keep in mind that at this point in the game, most enemies are rolling around with somewhere in the vicinity of ah, 50 or so magic protections. It's not a whole lot. 20 to 30 percent, again pulling in its passive, 20 to 30 percent of that is a grand whopping hairy two on average, right? It's, I'm sorry, it's not two, it's 10 technically, right? Because 20 percent of 50 is 10. Why did I say two? Anyways, brain fart. But that's only 10 flat penetration, which you can get more than that out of Spear the Magus, and also 30 more power and cooldown reduction, and a really sweet passive that reduces your cooldowns. This is why Persephone and a lot of other mages typically bust out Spear of Desolation as their third item, rather than Obsidian Shard. So Vulcan's only real issue this match was obsidian shard that is way too early to be building that actually if vulcan just swapped where they were building the obsidian shard and spear of desolation they'd be so much better off again vulcan got away with this due to lancelot absolutely dominating due to that early bastet death and the persephone suffering as a result but basically if vulcan had done what persephone had done he would have done a little bit better but if one final interesting note, it is interesting to note that the Scotty went with the ability-based version, which is very interesting. I like that. I don't have a particular problem with that. And that was actually a really great idea. Why? I mentioned earlier that Ferocious Roar is quite a problem for supports, because of the damage it does. Well, it's quite a problem for ADCs as well, because Zingtian's Ferocious Roar cuts basic attack damage by half. So, this generally causes a lot of problems for ADCs for the fairly obvious reasons, right? But Scotty, recognizing this, went ability-based, so that did not even become an issue. Yes, she was still hitting hard with her auto-attacks because she obviously was stacked with power, but she was very clearly building more in the line of ability-based damage. Jotun's Wrath, Brawler's Beatstick, Bluestone Pendant... All of these are great items for ability-based. In fact, the only thing that even alludes to auto-attacks is Blood Forge, for Pete's sakes. Right? And by that point, she only built Blood Forge because it was too late to be building Soul Eater, and I'm pretty sure she was only building that for the 75 power. She was just trying to maximize her power. That's it. Right? That wasn't built for the lifesteal. But... I think that was a really great counterbuild, and that's a big reason why Scotty was so successful in this particular match. Now, there was nothing particularly rom, rom, holy cow. There's nothing particularly wrong with the Roms build. Again, this was Roms' problems in this match mostly came from the fact that Scotty, first off, is just very difficult to box for anyone. Although Rom doesn't usually have as much problem boxing her, but it's still a tough boxing match. And additionally, Lancelot stomping on his face every so often definitely doesn't help him, right? Once he fell behind, thanks to Lancelot and Scotty, he couldn't catch up. He stayed behind, right? But, yeah, with that being said, thank you all very much for joining me. Uh, hold on. I just want to point out one other interesting thing. I actually didn't mention this because I wasn't sure how to react to this. But thinking about it, I think I know. I just want to point out that Gilgamesh built the earring here for the express purpose of MP5. I don't know if Gilgamesh was intending to finish this. My guess is no. <laughs> I think he just built this for the MP5 and was going to sell it later on. I think. Again, I'm not 100% sure, but it's, it, that's a choice. But uh, yeah, with that being said, thank you all very much for joining me. If you liked this, please like and subscribe. If you didn't, please ignore me. And if you have any comments, questions, concerns, ideas, suggestions, or requests, please leave them down in the comment section below. And thank you all very much for joining me, and have a great 24 hours.